All right, man, it's good to be in back at another Bible study as we're start, we begin last uh, lesson with Because We Are His series, and last week was about holiness principles. Today is going to be about the adornment question, part one. But before we get started, let's just open up with prayer right now. God, we thank you for what you have been doing in our midst. Lord, whoever's watching this today, Lord, including, Lord, me being the one teaching, I pray that we all, including myself, that we apply the word of the Lord in our heart, that we apply it, God, and let it find a lodging place. The writer said, let me hide the word in my heart that I might not sin against thee, O God. I pray, God, that you would allow us to grow in thee, that our minds would be upon Christ, and that our eyes would be upon thee. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There are two very clear and concise uh, package, uh, passages excuse me, uh, in the New Testament which deals with the subject of adornment for Christian women. Uh, Paul, both Paul and Peter express very similar admonition, thus what I would call the standards of the first century apostolic uh, becoming very clear to us of what it was like to be an apostolic there in the first century through even a very casual study. Paul's teaching is found in a different context than Peter's since Paul was dealing with the conduct and the appearance of women in the church and Peter is dealing with the conduct of, of appearance of women in the home, especially when there was an unsaved husband that was present. Note that the principles, though, of modesty and decency and outward appearance apply equally in either setting. Basically, Paul deals with what I would call the theological reasons for modest adornment, while Peter deals with the practical reasons for modest adornment. These were definitely areas of concern in the early church. For Christianity was born, understand, in that Roman world of luxury and moral decline. It was in this context that apostolics were called to live their faith in that early century. So I want to begin with 1 Peter 2 and 8. It's Paul talking to Timothy here. And Paul said, I will therefore that men... Pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness, sobriety, not with broaded hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usher authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, this is Paul talking more in that theological reasons for modest adornment. Now, let's look at Peter as he's talking about the practical, uh, uh, therefore, modesty. First Peter 3 and 1 through 7. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. And we brought out last lesson in lesson one that this word conversation in the Greek literally means lifestyle, not just your speech, but in how you live your life. It goes forward and it says, while they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of the platen of the hair, of the wearing of gold, or of the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament 
of a meek and a quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this matter, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husband, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. So we're looking at a lot of the word adorn. Of course, this is the adornment question, part one. What does the word adorn mean? It means to beautify or to decorate with ornaments. The Greek word is cosmio, from which we deride our English word cosmetics. It comes from the root word cosmos, which is translated world, but also has the meaning of order, arrangement, or declaration. Thus, just as the attractive and the orderly arrangement of the stars of the skies, God beautified it. Uh, God and how God or, or uh, he adorns the whole world with the sun and with the moon and the stars. So humans can adorn themselves. The Bible is letting us know that. But the topic of adornment thus covers not only the area of modern cosmetics, but it also talks about jewelry. However, the Bible makes it very clear that the way that women often desire to adorn themselves is in direct opposition to the way that God desires for them to adorn themselves. So understand, I'm not saying that it is wrong for a woman to adorn themselves as long as it is not in opposition to what God would have them to do. Uh, a honest biblical study of makeup and jewelry is out to be very offensive to many, especially in the century that we're living in, since most women today engage in their use. Uh, for example, there is no way to get around the fact that the Bible strongly teaches face painting to be the practice of harlots or a modern day term, the using of cosmetics and wearing makeup. This is not um, meant to mean that anyone who uses makeup in this day and time is therefore a harlot. However, the Bible does admonish each and every individual to forsake such a practice because it is unfitting to their Christian character and modesty. Understand that there are basically three positions taken in regards to adornment. Number one, hoping you're not getting too much background noise. Uh, we got construction going on outside with the, our new life center building. Thank the Lord. I'll, it's the sound of progress. But number one uh, position taken in regards to adornment is what I call full restriction. Full restriction. This states, teaching states, that all external adornment is wrong. Some would hold this viewpoint may, that they may even forbid the use of perfume, creams, hair clips, functional jewelry, such as wristwatches. Uh, I have literally seen churches uh, or, or heard of them. Let me put it that way. I don't want to add to anything. But when I was a kid, I was hearing my forefathers talk about, you know, that individuals will literally believe you could even wear deodorant. Well, I promise you, this pastor does not teach that nor believe that. So a full restriction there of going all the way to this extreme then you have the opposite of extreme, which is no restriction. This teaching states that external adornment is basically of no consequence to God. Extremists who hold this viewpoint teach that it is legalistic to put any restrictions on women 
or man as to how they appear. And then you have what I call a more balanced approach. This is some restrictions. This teaching states that the Bible, through its examples and, and admonition, there, sets forth very clear principles on adornment to guide women in godly women. Or excuse me, godly living, excuse me. So decisions on the details of adornment must be based on the larger scriptural principles, which are not open. First, excuse me, Second Peter 1 and 20 lets us know to any private interpretation. Simply because every detail of adornment is not a scripture absolute, meaning that we got black and white scriptures for every single thing of adornment. It does not imply that there are no absolutes. You see, extremes are easy, but consistency is more difficult. Before dealing with the New Testament passages concerning adornment, it will be very wise for us to examine the history of adornment as it relates to God's people within the Old Testament. Since 1 Peter 10 and 11 lets us know that these things were written for our admonition. Bear in mind the following points. There is implicit teaching. In the Old Testament, we may find God's condemnation of certain practices in his consistent express attitude towards them rather than in a direct prohibition. In such cases, we look to the New Testament's explicit teaching to expand on the principle that is given. Since it is obvious that God reveals his will for us, not only by precepts, but also by examples, the numerous instances of seduction, adultery, apostasy, and divine punishment resulting from the use of jewelry and cosmetics should constitute a solemn warning for each and every one of us. We got the earthly tabernacle in the Old Testament where God dwelt among his people. But it was in the tabernacle or the people or the temple, excuse me. But in the New Testament, when we move from the old to the new, now our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and God dwells in us. Hallelujah. Thus the tabernacle itself is normally a better type of how we should live than the often rebellious Israelites. You see, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was undecorated on the outside, uh, but it was extremely beautiful on the inside. Thus, it was not Israel's glory, but it was God's glory. When we look at the typology of adornment, Gold in the Bible was obviously a type of God's divinity. Gold is always a symbolic of God's divinity. For in every earthly structure God dwelt in, the inside uh, had virtually everything covered with gold. Only in the church age has it finally become possible for the divine gold of God's presence to be in man and not just with man. I'm with you, but I shall be in you. And then we got descriptive passages within the word of God. And as careful study of some of these passages, which seem to speak favorably of the use of ornaments, it will reveal that they are descriptive of the prevalent cultural understanding of beauty and not prescriptive of how God wants his people to beautify themselves. Failure to make this distinction can lead many times to unrealistic conclusion. You know, there was a renowned Old Testament scholar, Walter Kayser, who points out that reporting or narrating a event in Scripture is not to be equated with approving, recommending, or making that action or characteristic normative 
of emulation by all subsequent readers. That's Walter Kaiser and Old Testament ethics. We, as saints of God, must constantly search for God's attitude towards a practice and not adopt it just because it is included in a descriptive passage of Scripture. Details of stories or parables should be looked upon as the props of the story and not be used to formulate doctrine unless there is fundamental teaching that is confirmed by the gender tender of the Scripture. Example, when Moses grounded up the golden calf, to powder and he threw it in the water and he made them to drink. It could be unfair that God wants the gold on the inside and not on the outside. So we're going to take the gold, we're going to melt it down, get it into a powder, and now we're going to drink it. We know better than that, though. So these are, we'll go through some descriptive passages, but there's also some things we're going to look at called progressive revelation. To put it frankly, not everything that was allowed in the Old Testament times is reflected of God's ideal for his people. In fact, he said in his word, there was a time that I once winked at ignorance, but now I call all men to repentance. There are some typical examples that God allowed in the Old Testament. Polygamy, uh, divorce, uh, and, and remarriage over and over again without a biblical reason, uh, which were allowed in Old Testament times because of Israel's stubbornness. We do not find explicit condemnations of such practices in the Old Testament. Uh, David had multiple wives. Uh, Jacob had multiple wives, on and on and on. Uh, but we certainly find where this was prohibited or condemned upon in the New Testament. The same principle of progressive revelation applies to adornment. So now let's look at adornment, first of all, in the Old Testament. Pieces of jewelry were used as money in Old Testament times simply because they were so valuable in ancient culture. They could be used as barter for items or, or in payment of a dowry, uh, as in the case of the gift from Abraham's servant to Rebekah when Isaac was looking for a bride. Rebekah's story is a very beautiful parallel to the church. Abraham's servant is a type of God's anointed ministry, seeking to find a bride for Christ and presenting her with great gifts when she consents. It is important to note that jewelry was originally a blessing from God, not a curse. Abraham was wealthy in silver, wealthy in gold, and God even instructed Israel to take the jewelry of the Egyptians on the night uh, that they were freed from bondage. Uh, this was God's blessing upon Israel for it would give them the currency which they would need to survive upon their journey. Until this point, jewelry seemed basically to be viewed positively because of its practical function. However, a disturbing trend begin to develop among God's people at the same time as they begin to use their ornaments as an expression of pride and even sensuality. This development helps us to understand why in the Old Testament God began to call his people to repentance. And one of the first things that he would do is tell them to remove their ornaments. The first episode that we find of this is in Genesis 35 and 1 through 4. When Jacob, uh, with him, that to lead his family members in an inward spiritual cleansing, he summons them first to an outward cleansing. Let's look at it in the Word of God, Genesis 35, 1 through 4. And Jacob said, excuse me, God said unto Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel. Bethel is the house of prayer. Dwell there. 
make there a altar unto God. An altar's where we die at. And that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau, thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, notice, put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob, I want you to look at this whole verse, all the strange God which was in their hand. Okay, all the idol gods that they got from Uncle Laban's house. And also, all of their earrings, uh, which were in their ears, uh, and Jacob hid them. It wasn't just the what was in their ears, but everything that was in their hands. Uh, and Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. Notice that they delivered to Jacob not only their idols, but also their jewelry. Because they recognize that this also would have been a barrier to being accepted with God. And to ensure that his family members would not be tempted to backslide, Jacob wisely buried the idols and the jury under a tree before proceeding on the journey. This was the first time that we find this in Scripture, but it definitely was not the last time. You see, the situation comes to a crisis point in Exodus chapters 32 and 33. We find Moses on Mount Sinai. He's receiving the Ten Commandments. Uh, tired of waiting for Moses and very anxious to have a visible God because they have been sir, they have been living, excuse me, in Egypt with all the idol gods. Uh, the Israelites brought their ornaments to Aaron uh, who used them to make a molten calf in an imitation of one of the greatest gods of Egypt, uh, the the golden calf, or the calf, excuse me, that they would worship the calves. So Moses was warned by God of the apostasy that was going on in the camp. So I could see Moses as he hastily returned, only to find the people dancing around the idol, taking the worship that's supposed to be given to God, God himself, the supreme God, and giving it to false idol worship. Uh, Moses becomes very angry and he throws down the table of stones. Uh, he begins to break them to signify that they had broken their covenant with God. Uh, he destroyed the golden calf uh, and with the help of the Levites, the ministry, uh, he punished the, those who have persisted in rebellion. Israel had turned into idols the most valuable gift that God had given them. When Moses went up again to the mountain to plead with God to forgive their sins, God reassured the man of God, Moses, that he would keep his covenant to bring Israel to the land of Canaan. But he himself, God himself, would not go with them. If he were to appear among them in their rebellious state, God's direct presence would mean their complete destruction because he is holy. When Israel learned that God would no longer guide them with his personal presence, they deeply began to repent of their sin and they took off their jury in response God offered to reconsider his action towards them. But he requested that they prove the depth of their repentance by not just temporarily removing their jewelry and their ornaments, but by permanently removing their ornaments. Exodus 33 and 5 through 6, For the Lord had said unto Moses, saying to the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up and to the midst of thee in a moment, and I will consume thee. 
Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. God recognized that their jury was a serious obstacle in the reconciliation with God. Or excuse me, Israel recognized this. So they stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. If you look at it in the Amplified Bible, I know in the King James that we're reading out right now, it says, by the Mount Horeb. But in the Amplified, it simply says this, from Mount Horeb onward. It says that in the Amplified Bible, in the Revised Version, in the New American Standard, and many other commentaries. The Bible in basic English states that they did not put them on again. While Moffat's new translation of the Bible says that this happened at the mountain of Horeb and ever after. Thus Israel made a very sincere commitment to discontinue the use of ornaments in order to show their honest desire to obey God. This experience closely resembles that of Jacob's family that they had done prior at Shechem that we talked about earlier. God's command to Israel to remove their ornaments before going into the land of Canaan applies to us as we journey and make our journey to our promised land. Canaan, understand, is not a type of heaven. Uh, you say, man, I thought Canaan was heaven. No, 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 no. It's not a type of heaven, but it is of a deeper spiritual experience with God that we're living right now. You say, but man, I thought Canaan was a type of heaven. Understand that Canaan was fighting giants. Canaan was fighting battles, marching around the walls of Jericho. We ain't don't have any giants to fight in heaven. We're not don't have any walls to have to come down in heaven. Thankfully, we don't have the walls of Jasper and the gates of perils. Uh, hallelujah. But it is that deeper spiritual experience that we as saints of God are dealing with right now. Why were ornaments such a stumbling block to the spiritual lives of of Israel. Why does the Bible teach that jury is detrimental to our spiritual life? Part of the answer is that we wear what we worship and we worship what we wear. Our clothing, ornamentation best reveals our idols. Whether they are beauty, wealth, on and on. To adorn our bodies with jewelry turns the attention from God, the focus to God, to us. And it promotes the court of self, which is idolatry. That is why outward adorning is a stumbling block to the inner spiritual life of every man and woman. When God instructed Moses to take up a free will offering for the construction of the tabernacle, at the very top of the long list of suggested items was gold. God was not forcing it from the Israelites, but the suggestion was very strong. Exodus 35 and 22, they must have taken the hint because the Bible said that they brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets and all jewels of gold to the Lord. Israel also freely decor, dedicated, excuse me, to the Lord, the spoils of their future military victories. Numbers 31 and 50, the Bible said what every man had gotten of jewels of gold, chains, bracelets, rings, earrings, and tablets, it was given to God. God eventually verbalized his hatred for jury on his people. Deuteronomy 7 and 25 through 26, the Bible says that the graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or the gold that is on them, not take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into the house, lest thou shalt be 
cursed thing like it, but thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Even the kings of Israel were forbidden, among other things, to accumulate silver and gold. Deuteronomy 17 and 17, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. King Solomon later transgressed these laws and it cost him his relationship with the Lord. We find that Joshua pronounced the sentence of death upon Achan and his family because they kept gold and silver instead of turning it over to the treasury of the Lord. When Gideon broke the commandment of God and took the errands of the Ishmaelites and made them into a priestly vestment for himself, he caused all of Israel to backslide. Note from this passage that jewelry was a trademark of the sinful Ishmaelites and not of Israel except when they backslid. The Bible says in Judges 8 and 24 through 27, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that you would give me every man the errands of his prey, the enemy. For they had golden errands because they were Ishmaelites. And the answer we will willingly give them. They spread a garment and did cast therein every man the errands of his prey. And it goes forth and it says, And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, besides ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that was about their camel's neck. And Gideon made an ephod thereof, and he put it in his city, even into Orpha. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which stain became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Spent a lot of time up to this point. This is the end of part one. And I realize it's a little bit shorter than the last lesson, but it's part two and part one together. I felt like it was just too much to do all at one time. Uh, you know, the, the, it, it, I, I didn't want to overwhelm any individual that would be watching this. The part two, we'll get more into talking about what Paul talked about and what Peter talked about. Because I just don't want to talk about the Old Testament. I want to talk about the New Testament. And so uh, stay with us and, and, and stay attuned. Uh, and, and Lord willing, we'll be getting you the next lesson as soon as possible. Uh, let's close with prayer just like we have uh, with the other lessons. God, we thank you, God for your virtue, for your grace, and for your mercy. We realize we're not saved by works, but the Bible says we are saved by grace and by faith, And you, but you did save us unto good works, God. So, Lord, I want to be made, I was made already in your image. I want to represent that image according to your will and your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May God bless you until next time.